Reporting for MHS News, I'm Jackson Estwanek. Today, I am so grateful to be having a conversation with Dr. Steve Hankins, Principal of Marquette. It is currently Thursday, April 16th, 2020, and at the date of this interview's recording, we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is in addition to many other ups and downs that have transpired over the past year at Marquette. And I thought, who better to get perspective from than my friend, Dr. Hankins. Dr. Hankins, how are you doing, sir? Doing well. It's been, uh, it's been a good morning so far. So, mm-hmm. so uh, my first question is going to be a hard hitter. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. Why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about your family? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, my wife, is uh, she's a teacher, uh, teaches fourth grade at Wentzville. And uh, like all of our teachers at Marquette, uh, kind of got thrown into this ALP uh, situation, too. So she's been on the learning curve, and it's been, been really great for me because I've been able to see really firsthand at home how much uh, work uh, and, and time teachers are having to put into their classrooms and really how important kids are wanting to see their teachers. So that, that's been really cool. Uh, my oldest, uh, Abby's back from college. So she goes to Truman and she came home, uh, for her spring break and that got extended until indefinitely. We don't know how long or when they'll go back, but, uh, she's been doing her courses online, a lot of work. Uh, then my three others, I got two in high school and, uh, they're enjoying being able to sleep in later, that's for sure. Then I've got a 10-year-old, and uh, she is doing the same thing. She's uh, Luckily for her, uh, you know, she still loves playing outside, so the you know, weather's been okay, so she's been able to get outside and run around a little bit, um, which has been nice. So thank you for asking. Everyone's healthy, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm doing well myself. So uh, I'm, I'm running more than I ever have. Uh, I have the opportunity to... At least uh, I, I try to at least once a day get outside and do something active for about an hour, or else I'll go insane like everybody else. So, mm-hmm. could you give me a little background, or give me some of your background in education, and explain kind of how you got your career to where it is now? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a house of educators. I mean, a, a long line of educators. My mom uh, taught elementary school. Uh, she taught middle school. Um, believe it or not, um, she also opened up her own school at one point. I was in middle school at the time, but she opened a, a school called uh, Sober High. And so it was for um, kids who were getting sober, uh, but had academic issues, you know, had, had either dropped out of high school or, or were failing high school. So she opened up a school uh, kind of before all this alternative schooling was going on. She opened it up and helped a lot of kids get their GEDs uh, and get them on their way who were recovering from that. So uh, my aunts, uncles, I've got tons of teachers. My, my grandma on my dad's side was a teacher. My grandfather on my uh, mom's side uh, was a teacher and a coach and a ref. Um, so that kind of just growing up with family reunions and during holidays, there was always talk about school and teaching and what was going on with classes. Really, for me, it wasn't until my summer of my senior year, so right before I'm heading off to college, uh, I needed a job. I wanted to make some money. I actually helped my mom's class at the time. Uh, they took a field trip to Camp Wyman, and they do like low ropes and team building. And so I went with her to help chaperone. Uh, and at that moment, uh, one of the persons that was leading it before I left that day asked if I was interested in a job as a camp counselor. I needed a job. I said, yeah, what the heck? I'll, I'll try it out. And I went back for three summers uh, as a camp counselor. Uh, I worked with basically teenagers, um, we, you know, canoeing, kayaking, camping out, survival skills, um, just had a great time working with, uh, with youth. And I mean, I was young at the time too, but it, it, was, it was a great experience. And so that kind of got me going, thinking maybe this is what I'd like to do. Fortunately for me, I was at a great school at the time. It was the Northeast Missouri state university. Now it's Truman, uh, but they've got a great teaching program. And at the moment at that, I was, a, I was a history major. I loved history. And I really started thinking about teaching, and they've got a, a master's program there uh, that I applied for uh, and got into, and I've had a, had a great experience. So, and, and also, I, I should say, it gave me an opportunity. I, I love coaching. I love football. I love sports. And so it was also an opportunity for me to not only teach the subject I love, uh, but to be around the, the sports I love. Did you ever think that you would become a principal or even more stressful, a high school principal? Yeah, so um, 
I started my teaching career at, at Knox County, uh, which is in Edina, Missouri. Uh, and for those people listening, you can go find a map and look it up. Great little town, farming community, one building, K through 12. Everything was right there. Just met great people, great kids. It really was a great experience. Um, at that time, I was like, no, I, teaching was the only thing I was going to do. I loved it. Uh, I had the opportunity to come go to Kirksville High School, which was the big high school then. You know, they paid better, and uh, it was uh, the biggest high school in that area. And that was, of course, right where uh, Truman was at. So I, I was very familiar with the area. A guy named Pat Williams, who was the principal there at the time, was the first one. That was probably my third year of teaching. That was my third year of teaching. I was out doing helping uh, bus duty in the morning, and we got to talking. And he said, "Have you ever thought about being an administrator?" I said, nah, I really haven't. He's like, well, in the future, I think, you know, maybe it's something you should think about. Uh, I think you'd be really good at it, which, you know, that was a big compliment. I mean, it, it, as far as him seeing that potential in me at that, at that age, uh, that being that young. So I started taking some classes, but really thinking towards the end, end of my career. At that time, that young, my hope was to be a maybe department chair, uh, the social studies department at some point, uh, be a head football coach of the varsity program do those things, and then eventually get an administration. So a little bit more history. So I was, I was at Kirksville High School for three years teaching and coaching, and I actually did my student teaching way back when at Marquette High School. I grew up in that area, was always a um, dream to go back to that area. I love Rockwood. I love I love the community. So after my fifth year of teaching, I got hired as a teacher at uh, Marquette High School. So that was really cool to come back. Some of my old teachers that I had at Lafayette, because I'm a Lafayette graduate, some of my old teachers were, were, were at Marquette by then because they transferred over from Lafayette. So I got a chance to teach with some of the teachers that I absolutely loved. I mean, just great people. So that was just exciting. And, you know, and, and they really took me under their wing. Uh, I had a chance to coach football. So I did that for a couple years. I uh, taught government, AP government, U.S. history. And I was actually in the middle of summer. We had started football already. Uh, I was a freshman head coach. One of the administrators at that time had left to be a head principal at, at a middle school. And so they had an intern position opened up because it was so late and it opened up for, uh, you know, rocket personnel. So I applied for it thinking it'd be a good interview opportunity. It'd be a good chance to, to kind of get a feel for what type of questions, what do I need to prepare for? Really not thinking I had a shot uh, and really not knowing if I was ready for it yet. Uh, so I went and did the interview, and I probably got it because I was relaxed. <laughs> I, I kind of went in there like, hey, this is me, and here's, here's my thoughts on that, you know, on, on the different subjects. And I got a call uh, that next day saying, we'd love for you to be a principal, an assistant principal. So I jumped right in, uh, uh, and I became an assistant principal at Marquette for six years. So that was kind of my, my road to administration. So did I ever think I would be a, the Marquette principal? Uh, that those thought processes really didn't start coming around until probably my you know my second third year being an administrator, kind of getting my feet underneath me, saying maybe in the future that is something I would love to do. Sometimes I, I can't believe that it, you know, I'm actually the principal of Marquette. Uh, it's such a privilege. So, when did you start teaching at Marquette? Okay, so that would have been let's see 2002, I believe. With teaching and admin, I was there for eight years, so 2010, and then um, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Fort Zumwalt School District, uh, which was actually a great opportunity, and I learned a lot um, because I was able to go to another district and kind of see what they did, you know, the systems they had in place, their content, their curriculum, uh, and I was there for uh, five years as an assistant there, and then the associate position opened up at Marquette. I applied for it and got it. Uh, and I absolutely love being the associate principal, love working with Dr. Matheson, love really coming back home. I felt like I was coming back home. Uh, I really missed that community. So it was a great opportunity. And now here I am as the principal. We're kind of in current day's time now with you talking about it. So let's start back in April. You were recommended to the Rockwood Board of Education for the position of head principal on April 8th and then recognized three days later as actually getting the position. Um, and then you were going on to assume that position on July 31st. After it was announced that you would become the head principal, you stated that the biggest change and challenge uh, of your first year would be flex time. Why did you say that? Brand new to the district, uh, brand new to, you know, uh, just a, a student's normal way of life. And there was, what people don't understand, there are so many 
things you've got to plan uh, and, and account for, whether that's how do you do lunch, facility space, how does it affect instruction, how are we going to manage office hours, um, how to work with teachers on what do what does this flex time work, look for them as administrators, you know, what is our role, and so you can have kind of an ideal of like here's what we like to look at. Uh, and, and I knew, we, you know, we had great plans, but I also am a realist knowing once it starts, things are going to change. We're going to have to make adjustments. Uh, and I knew that was going to take a lot of time while trying to also learn how to be the principal. So, you know, along with all the other things, like anytime you start a new job, there are, uh, even if it's in the same company, so to speak, you've got to learn your new roles, what's expected. Uh, and really kind of figure out how you want to do the job. And so in the meantime, I knew that was going to be difficult. But with that added wrinkle, uh, which was a big one, um, I knew that was going to be a challenge that I couldn't let fail. Uh, that needed to succeed because uh, it was going to help with the rest of the year. If we can get that rolling, really, I hoped it would you know, go smooth. Um, and from the feedback I've gotten from students and teachers, I think we've done a great job at Marquette. I think it's, a, it's been a big, big benefit. I think it still can be improved, but where uh, uh, the, the advantages far outweigh the issues we have with it. Um, you know, and, and now, again, we'll, that's a continual process. We'll look at it, fine-tune it, um, and then hopefully it'll be even better next year for, for students and staff. Could you kind of explain your involvement in the creation of Flex Time? Because I know you were super in that process, um, and obviously, especially for our school. So when they did the uh, high school review, which uh, I don't know how many years, I'd say either either four, either 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 four or five years, they get together, they talk about new directions, what do we need to change, and so that committee at large had some things they wanted to do with the schedule. And one of those things was um, this idea of flex time, which is not new to education. It's just new to our area, so to speak. Parkway does something similar to flex time already. They don't call it that, but they do have an academic time uh, in some of the Parkway schools. So it wasn't new. It was just really new to Rockwood. Uh, But we really looked at uh, a lot of things we wanted to accomplish as far as social-emotional uh, for students, uh, hopefully taking some stress off, which I've seen this do a lot. I mean, chance to get homework, chance to meet with their teachers, uh, but also a, a chance to kind of give them some freedom. Uh, because one of the things we also found where students were saying when they go to college, uh, some students feel like they don't have any time, like they just, they lose it. In reality, they have so much time in college, but what they're used to is a bell-to-bell schedule. That time is so structured for you as a high school student that when you go to college or whether that's a job or whatever, you get you have downtime when you're a high school student. You have downtime. You, you for lack of a better word, you socialize and you play because it's your downtime. Uh, and if you've got a job afterwards, it's that in between time. You don't have a lot of hours. Most high school kids don't between jobs, athletics, academics. Their downtime should be used for that. They don't really have any other downtime. But when you go to college, that downtime is different. Um, you might have a class at eight in the morning, and not one till noon. The temptation is go play Xbox or go back to bed. But in reality, you should go see your professors, go to the library, get your homework done. And if you can get in that habit, make those good choices, even in a small scale at a high school, it's going to help when you go to college. Uh, and I've seen that with our flex. I mean, in the beginning, it was very much social. But as the year it's progressed, more and more and more kids. And some of that is some of the tweaking we've done to it as far as especially on C-Day flex, which I know some kids – weren't exactly thrilled about moving it after a uh, second hour. And I understand the reasons why, but we really needed that time to focus on uh, academics, but still allow socialization. And it's really worked. If you walk up now to our second and third floors during a C day, it, it's business. Uh, kids are up there meeting with teachers, getting work done uh, and kids who want a break, they can go down to the comments and still have that break. Uh, so it's been, it's evolving. And I think what I'm excited about, remember, we started it this year. K, I mean, 9 through 12, no one had experience with it. There was The underclassmen didn't have any people to look up to. Everybody was trying to figure it out. Next year we go into it, 
the sophomores, juniors, and seniors, they've already had it. They're going to know what is expected, the behaviors, and that is going to help those freshmen so much to understand this is business. This is what we do. Because I can put out a rule book. I can put out emails. The bottom line is students lead by example. And we've got such a great student body that if they go about their business the way they're supposed to, those fresh, the new incoming freshmen are going to follow that lead. Uh, so I, I'm very thankful also to our upperclassmen, especially uh, how seriously they took it and the way they used it. So it's been great. Went off on a tangent there as far as the development of it. So I'm always I'm one of those persons that if we're going to do something, I would rather be a part of it and part of the planning part of the implementation to either, you know, A, help make it succeed, but it also gives me an opportunity and also our our teachers an opportunity for, for Marquette to have more input. Uh, and so Dr. Matheson, who was the, as the president, the principal at the time and myself, we kind of jumped on that and really looked into how that was going to work. Dr. Matheson kind of handed over to me for Marquette. So I created a committee uh, for Flex almost a year before Flex was implemented. That committee still is in existence. We still meet. Right now we haven't for obvious reasons, but they were awesome. Uh, the planning, uh, talking through how to do things, uh, and then we had uh, we had to plan with our staff at the beginning of the school year. Uh, we had some professional development with that. Uh, and some things worked really well and some things didn't, and we've had to tweak, but I think more than anything was getting the mindset right. Uh, and, and I think, you know, reflecting back of kind of some things I did probably well, I guess give the freedom to let teachers know it, we're all learning. Um, and so it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to try new things and actually please try new things. And as something works, get it out to staff uh, and maybe it'll work for them too. So really just opening up those doors and listening to students and to teachers about what working and what is not working helped it evolve. And I think being open to that uh, was, I, I would say, you know, in my own assessment was was beneficial to everybody and, and helped it succeed. So it was and still is a challenge, uh, but so worth it. Uh, it was definitely worth the time and is worth the time. So in late July, you and I actually met up at school to record a video for 4E Intruder Safety. Um, and... As the school year approached, what was the summer like for you uh, before becoming the principal? Oh, a lot of it was just trying to figure out what I've got to get ready for the school year. What, what does first year staff meeting look like? Uh, is the facility ready? Talking with my my other administrators, what, what are things that we've got to get ready for orientations? Uh, is the schedule ready? So really what winds up happening is you are, especially that first year, I mean, as an associate, I had a good handle on what people did and, and who got what done. The big piece was communication was, you know, what, what do I send out to parents? What do I send out to kids? And, and really just preparing for it. So it was a lot of work of just trying to figure out what needed to happen before the school year started. And also hoping that you didn't miss anything big. <laughs> you know, it's one of, you know, and that was talking with other principals from other schools. They were very helpful with saying, hey, here's what I'm doing. Did you think about this? And we also, my academic council, uh, which are the department chairs for uh the different content areas and the building, great leaders. Uh, they were also very helpful saying, hey, you need to make sure you do this or don't forget about this. And so the nice thing is I had those relationships with the leaders at Marquette already. So I think that made it easier than maybe most first principals coming into it. Uh, I knew people. I knew who to talk to. I felt pretty like I was doing, you know, I did a, an effective job at the beginning of that first school year to, to get it off right. Mm -hmm. I remember doing an interview with you uh, right before the first flex time, how did you feel those first couple of weeks went? Because I remember we were constantly changing schedules, getting ready for that to happen. Yeah, it was nerve, you know, nerve wracking. You know, you're, you're, you're you know, it's, it's coming. You're hoping for the best. You think you've got everything prepared, but knowing there's going to be things that you didn't think of that are going to happen. But for the most part, it was, it was just being nervous and excited about everything that was going on. Um, but then, of course, uh, we had a tragedy uh, very early on uh, in the school year, which uh, was hard for everybody. Um, and really, 
it really put my focus back on what was important. And the reason I say that is this, um, and the summer in those first couple of weeks, it really was systems thinking, so to speak, making sure the system's running, making sure that, for lack of a better term, the buses are on time or the trains are on time. When, um, when we lost one of our students at the beginning of the school year, um, it really shook me. I think it shook everybody um, to the core. Um, so unexpected, such a wonderful young man. Uh, it, it, even now, I, I have a hard time talking about it. Um, yeah, so let's let's kind of talk about that. On the evening before, actually, the first day of Flex, obviously something gravely saddening happened in the Marquette community. Um, Junior Josh Gandhi passed on Wednesday, August 21st, and I remember hearing rumors floating around on social media and then, you know, suddenly realizing that it was real and starting to understand the gravity of the situation. That was a night that, as you said, we'll never forget. How did you first hear about the news? Got a phone call uh, from our resource officer that there was an incident uh, in the Marquette quadrant uh, that it involved, uh, I'm not quite sure who it involved, but it was, and he let us know, but it involved one of our students. So, of course, at that point, I'm, I'm praying and hoping that everything's okay. Uh, he said he'd call me back later. It wasn't too much later that he called me back and confirmed that uh, Josh had passed away. It was shocking. Um, and, you know, the first thing, you know, really, I, I had to step back um, and try to focus uh, I should say, uh, uh, well, I reached out to Dr. Counts uh, and let her know what was going on. Uh, Dr. Miles uh, let him know what was going on. Uh, and they were, and Dr. Harris, they were great as far as uh, that night of that event. I don't know if you remember, there was a huge storm and we lost a bunch of power poles in the back lot of Marquette and we lost all power that night. So when I was driving up to Marquette to start communications and meet with uh, Dr. Miles and uh, Dr. Calcaterra also offered to, to come up and help because unfortunately for Dr. Calcaterra, uh, she had just, Lafayette had just lost a student that summer. And so she had just been through, uh, as far as the processes, kind of, you know, you need someone there to say, here's what you need to do next. Um, and so she was just so helpful. So she, we were actually on our way up to, she was going to meet me at Marquette that night. And the storm hits, and we lose complete power. And at that time, I didn't know the parking lot had been overrun by power lines. I just knew I didn't have power. And so Dr. Calcaterra said, well, why don't we just meet at Lafayette? And so we drove over there. I try, you know, I try to reach out to the parents. Uh, obviously, I wasn't able to reach them at the time, but understandable why that was. And uh, we worked on a communication for staff and students. Uh, and then I uh, went about calling and actually uh, – Dr. Miles helped with that too. The superintendent went about calling the teachers of Josh because in the morning I knew I was going to meet with, had to meet with my staff and let them know what was going on. I, I didn't want his current teachers to have to walk in not knowing what was going on. I wanted them to have some time, hopefully, to process that before the morning came. And so we were able to get a hold of all his teachers and let them know what was going on, uh, what had happened. And so I got home two, three in the morning. Uh, after all of that, I lay down to go to sleep, um, try to, and, uh, Mr. Hudson calls me at five in the morning and says that a third of our parking lot is not usable. <laughs> uh, and so I got, woke up, got my car, uh, went to Marquette and met UE there. Dr. Ramsey was there. Mr. Hudson was there I spoke with them about what to do. Cause you know, we, we've got seniors who are driving. We had to get the word out that their parking spaces weren't available to use it, you know, and so, really, at that point, speaking with UE, and I looked at Dr. Ramsey and Mr. Hudson, I said, you, you guys need to handle this. You, it's yours. Uh, and they did. They took. They did an awesome job uh, because I had to go in and get ready to address the staff, uh, address the students later on, uh, and, and work through that. So, it was uh, a learning experience, um, one that I wish I never had. Uh, and uh, I just hope that I was able to at least – help people through that process uh for me i really it didn't really 
hit me as far as emotionally until about a day later. Uh, I had so many other things to think about, so many things to take care of. I was so worried about other people. Uh, I didn't realize what an emotional toll and physical toll it had taken on me to about a day or two later. Uh, and it, it, really, it really did have an impact on me. Right. And uh, I had completely forgotten about that power line situation, but what a mess. You know, you've talked a lot about what you've had to do uh, procedurally, but what did you have to do as a human in that instance? I prayed a lot. Um, you know, my God's very important to me. Uh, I find I find comfort when things go bad. I have confidence that it's going to be okay. That I'm good. That there, you know, there's going to be a there's going to be a way through it. And I leaned heavily on my wife. She was just there for me to be me, especially when I kind of let down my guard. I, I, I think. Eventually, I was able to uh, speak with the family. That was very helpful. Uh, I'm kind of built to help other people. And I, th- I think for me, a lot of me, as far as my, my, my personal way I got through it, was when I, people were just very gracious uh, and thanking me. That helped because I felt like I was doing something uh, to, to better the situation. And so for me, that, that helped me get through a, a tough time. And knowing that I had good people around me, too, my, you know, those, the teachers, uh, my administrative team, and, uh, you know, the central office, you know, Dr. Harris, Dr. Counts, uh, Dr. Miles, knowing that, you know, they've been through those situations before, too, that they were there to support me was comforting. Uh, I, was, I definitely did not feel alone, if that makes sense. I felt like there were lots of people there to help which I needed that strength because, you know, people are looking, and I do realize people do are, are, are looking at me and seeing what I'm going to do next and how we're going to address the situation. So hopefully I was able to successfully guide us through a hard time. And I think you did a really good job leading us through that time. But the, the one time that I think Marquette was really unified during that was when you made the announcement to the whole building what was that moment like for you? Um, I had a, uh, there was something that was prepared, kind of a, an outline um, to read. Um, and I tweaked it a little bit, and my plan was just to read it. Uh, and I can't really explain. I started reading it, and it just wasn't coming from the heart. And so I just pushed it aside and just started talking. I didn't know what else to do. I'm just thankful that, you know, the words came to me. Um, But it was. It was just from my heart. It was just, that's how I felt. And I I knew that's how we all felt. And so, really, uh, what I wrote down is not what I said. Uh, And I can't really, to this this day, I I don't almost remember what I said. It just, I knew it came out and it was genuine. And um, I'm glad that went okay. I'm glad that went well. Despite all that happened that day, what was your reaction to the first flex day after working so hard to make it a reality? You know, timing wise, God, can you imagine anything better? There were some people saying, Hey, you know, maybe we should postpone it or, you know, which was all really good thoughts and really good. You know, I understand why, but it was a C day flex to have an hour and a half the day after for kids who needed to, be with their friends and just process that time with any teacher they wanted to, any friend they wanted to. It got in. It was a blessing. I mean, it, it, I'm so glad we. It, it fell where it did. I, I mean, you couldn't have planned it, and I didn't. But you couldn't have planned it any better. I mean, it, it was it was a perfect timing for that, and really reinforced the need for that time for for situations like that. And so. When that flex time got over and it, everything kind of settled, I was like, oh, thank God. I mean, it, it, it went so much better than expected. And again, our students were amazing. And so were our teachers uh, through that whole thing. And so that was a shining moment, I guess, as far as for me thinking to myself, like, okay, this this is something that we needed and it, and it went well. I'm very, very happy that I, we had it and that it went well that day, for sure. There's a possibility it could have gone bad. Uh, and thank God it didn't. 
So moving on a little bit further, around October was when the news about flex time affecting Carnegie minutes uh, first came into circulation. Uh, when yeah. did you first become aware of that problem? About that same time. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously when we were planning through it and going through all that time, we thought we had all of our, you know, our T's crossed and I's dotted. We thought, we, you know, everything was fine. And then um, that possible issue popped up. It, ha- it gets a little confusing. It comes down to between Carnegie units, which is the actual seat time in a classroom, and uh, total school hours. Uh, total school hours is from when you guys get there until you leave each day. We were totally fine on that. In Carnegie units, we th- the, the balance kind of is this. Rockwood has higher expectations than what the state minimum is. And so kind of working through this, what we realized, uh, and that's why there was like, are we not going to meet it? Or is it going to be an issue? What's going to happen? Uh, what if we get more snow days and we're going to run into some problems? And so there's a lot of talk about that. Really, when we sat down and looked at it, we were fine with, with what the state required. Uh, it just took some time, and I know it got really nerve-wracking, uh, and, and I wish it never would have came up because it was a, a crisis I didn't need. <laughs> no one needed because uh, there was a lot of questions. Now, I get looking at the bright side of things. Out of that, when the when there was a fear or you know at that time a possibility of it going away, the amount of emails I got from teachers, from students, from parents saying how much they already saw the benefit of it, don't let it go away, was confirmation that it was working, uh, that that people liked what it was doing. So that was a good takeaway. Like oh boy, you know people people want to have it. Um, really. The only issue that has come up from all of it is there has been a loss of some instructional time. Uh, And I know you think, well, four or five minutes isn't a big deal, but it does impact some classes, PE, science, facts. And so that's the only kind of discussion we're having right now. You know, is is there a way to get some uh, instructional time back? How many times do we need to have flex in a week? Uh, It's not going away. We know the benefit of it. And we knew that, that this first year going through it. We're going to go see what works, and we're going to make adjustments. And so now, unfortunately, the data is going to be a little skewed uh, because of ALP. But, you know, looking at grades, looking at discipline, looking at its overall effectiveness, is a loss of, loss of instructional time having a negative impact on student achievement? Or is it having a, a negative effect on teachers being able to get through the content they need to get through? Uh, and so we're still very much uh, looking at that and, and trying to find the best balance. So let's take a break from the heavy stuff. What were some of your favorite moments from first semester? One that sticks out, and, and I, if you were there, it was just, it was, uh, it's still, the moment still amazes me. So we were, it was at a football game. We were playing one of the Parkway schools, and they unfortunately had a lot of injuries. Numbers were down. Uh, just a really, I mean, I feel horrible for them. They, they couldn't, they couldn't continue continue on with the game even i mean there's just no possible way they could and so at halftime basically they called the game uh and usually you know people leave go away but our football team ran up into the stands while our band performed uh and it just sent chills down my spine watching and listening to our student body cheering each other on that opportunity for our band and our flags to have really a large peer group who are completely focused on them it was just so cool to see that, that that happened. So that was probably one of my one of my favorite uh, memories from the very beginning of the school year was was just seeing that great school spirit, watching students support one another, and really, I mean, it's just kind of weird. It's talk, you know, as far as like good memories, you know, the the tragedy from Je- Jesh brought the best out in people. Uh, what I saw kids trying to do to help people who have mental illness and mental, you know, uh, just social, emotional well-being and helping those in need. There really was this focus and this kind of the spotlight on the serious issue and what can we do to help. And so I just saw the best in a lot of our kids reaching out to each other, making sure they're OK. So that that was just that was really cool to see. It was really, really, uh, you know, a tough situation for that to happen in. But uh, what, what came out of it, I'm hoping, will last. Uh, just for those kids who went through it, realizing that, you know, we need to treat each other well. And uh, we need to listen and we need to reach out. And if you're hurting, if you need help, to talk to somebody, anybody. Like I said, you know, you're not alone. 
you never are. There's there's people out here who love you very much, and you are important, and you are a valuable member to our community, and you will be missed. So do not do anything that's going to put that in jeopardy. Reach out, get help. You're important. So that was really that was a great message that I, that I that I saw our kids really come through with. So those are pretty emotional and powerful, uh, great memories I've had so far. Those are some really great sentiments to share, but I want to talk a little bit more about football because I know you coached and you're a big football fan, and obviously we had the best football season we've ever had at Marquette. What was that like as someone who's been in the Marquette community for so long, and I know uh, because I was there too that you saw them all the way through to their final game. What was that like? Oh, so proud of them. I mean, the amount of work those kids put in, in the summers and years, and the, the coaching staff, the amount of time. I mean, I, I've been on the varsity coaching staff hours, weekends. Uh, it, it, it's, it's total dedication. Their parents, I mean, it, it just, it's nice to see people who put that much work in uh, have success. And so I just was just so happy for them, happy for our school, just in general for It's always good when you've got... Uh, Winning teams, you know, winning is not everything, obviously, but winning helps. <laughs> you know, it does create goodwill. Uh, but to watch them, you know, get as far as Joplin, I mean, Joplin had a great team. There is no no shame in losing to Joplin last year. They were they were a powerhouse. They had some unbelievable athletes. Um, we had a, a couple stumbling blocks in the very beginning, but we once we kind of got our feet underneath us, we held our own. It was just we couldn't make up the deficit, unfortunately, uh, that we kind of created for ourselves at the end of the beginning of the game but our our, God, our, our kids played hard um, but that was a lot of fun to, just that whole time and heck I mean both both our ba- girls and boys basketball teams won uh won districts this year uh first time ever you know we just we had a had a really good year uh, so that that's been a lot because yeah I mean I do probably the reason I love being an administrator is I get to go to games but you know soccer we had a really good soccer team I know we we lost a lot a tough one versus Lafayette. Lafayette had a good team. We had some talented kids, but Cos Country had a great season. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. I and mean, I got to watch our swim win state, I and mean, that was that was exciting. We just we have a lot of great athletes, a lot of great kids. I, I, I went and saw our uh, our winter guard perform. They're amazing. Uh, I know cheer won state. Uh, our palms that you know did great uh, in their competition. So we just. We've got great coaches and unbelievable talented kids. So I love watching them perform and do what they do. What they do. I mean, our choir band. I mean, I think really you sit back and look at the excellence across the board. Everything our kids do at that school, it, it's it's amazing. Uh, and it comes down to the kids and some great great coaches and sponsors. Not to mention they've got great parents who support them. <laughs> it's not cheap. Uh, cheers, not cheap and. You know, getting baseball and, and paying for those those travel teams or whatever. You know, you know, parent support is key. Getting back and forth from practices when they're younger, and so you can just see that uh, when you see a, a team team win state or a football team go as far as Joplin, and you see you know our cheer and our swim, like I said, our swim win state, it, it just it feels good because you know their hard work has paid off. Now, I'd like to ask about something that I'm sure you've loved being questioned about by The Messenger for the past year. When will you be able to share information about the disappearance of Principal Kena Moore? The Messenger began investigations in early November, and you were always our key source, uh, which we thank you so much for always taking the time to talk to us, but you were never able to share any information. Yeah, and I'm still not. It's still very much as a HR uh, situation. So, out of respect for her, um, and that I, I'm not, I'm unfortunately unable to comment on it. Mm-hmm. And so, I know you can't tell me what happened or why, but I'd like to ask what is what is it like to be missing one of your four grade level principals? I mean, not only are they responsible for hundreds of kids in each grade, but they also manage departments and other building responsibilities. Yeah, uh, uh, it has been. Uh, it has definitely added to the workload for everyone in the administrative team. Again, we uh, have a great team, so everyone has pitched in, especially in the beginning. Uh, kind of divided up the work. We did have uh, Mrs. Kat Smarsik, who subbed uh, a little bit to, to help with day-to-day student discipline, and um, also Mrs. Rupert, who's the second 
secretary for the ninth grade. Uh, she was very much very helpful during that time too. So, yeah, I mean, it it, it definitely has uh, has created some more work. But I will say, uh, I think the administrative team has done a great job of uh, working through it uh, and putting kids first is what we've got to do. And we've done that. And so, you know, hopefully we haven't dropped the ball, so to speak, on anything big. Really, uh, I've had very, as, as far as just people asking what happened, uh, any issues we've been able to help parents with or students with. We either find them, get them to an administrator if they call the freshman office and Ms. Kasmarczyk wasn't there, or Mrs. Wackerly, who's the associate, or myself, or you know, Dr. Ramsey, or Mr. Hudson, or Mr. Dr. Regina now. Uh, they all chipped in and, and kind of just did it. Uh, went to IEPs, with the 504s, uh, helped with student concerns. And so, yeah, uh, and, and so and we all chipped in. Of course, we have to do some supervisions after school uh, which you know go watching sporting events which we love to do but it's also time away from our families uh, we just all divided those up and kind of took a little bit more on and so do you know if there has been a rehiring process put into place for next school year well I, all i can say is no matter what we, we will have a uh, yeah this will be taken care of before next school year uh and so that process is still ongoing okay Um, so now we're kind of at the end of first semester. Is there anything that you would have done differently? Differently? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's the little things, right? So I'm sure with, and you can, anyone can kind of relate to this. You look back on maybe individual conversations you had with somebody, whether that's a teacher or a parent, you look back at that conversation and think, I could have handled that a little bit better. And the reason I say that is that your day-to-day interactions is what builds that trust, builds uh, people willing to, I guess, give you the benefit of the doubt or have faith in you. And so uh, you, know, you kind of look back at those little those conversations uh, and, and, and you look back like, I wish I would have handled that a little bit different. But I think that's okay. I think you, you should be reflective. And I think you also have to have some grace for yourself to realize you're not going to do any, everything perfect. And you're human too. And there's days where you're stressed out. Maybe something's going on at home and, you know, you've been working nonstop for a couple of days and another crisis happens and you're like, oh, I, I wish I would have taken a deep breath before I made that comment. Or I, I try to stay grounded as much as possible. I try to keep a cool head as much as possible. But yeah, I mean, they're kind of looking back at that. I, I think as the year progresses and, and I think as I grow in this role too, as far as being able to see the bigger picture, uh, which I think I do a, a good job at, but I can always get better. I think maybe this time next year, I'll even have a better uh, thought of like, ooh, I should have done that differently because I'll be redoing redoing those events again at the beginning of the school year. Uh, and that's really where you kind of pull up your old notes. You start looking at things like, oh, yeah, that didn't go well. I need to do that. That changes a little bit differently. So um, I, I'm learning a lot. I, I, you know, I think that's probably the most important thing as far as regrets, things that I you know, could have done differently. Just those, those little conversations. Uh, most of them gone, went really well, but there's always – there's always those times where, the, where, you, where you don't and you leave and it's, you wish it would have gone better. Did you feel exhausted at all after the first couple months of kind of flying the ship? Yeah, it's, it's, it's mental exhaustion for a life. I mean, I, talk about family. I, uh, my, my 15 year old has been doing karate forever. This year I decided, well, I decided I would join her uh, and start doing that. So that was very helpful just to, well, at least twice a week to get out and do something physically active. So physically, uh, I never really got ran down, which was, which was good. But mentally, uh, yeah, it, it's, there's so many things going on. It's hard to, at times, keep track. Uh, and, and really, that's part of that growing process because I've got great people in place. I've got great leaders here where they can handle it. It's just one of those, I want to make sure everything goes well. Part of that exhaustion is my own fault of just letting go a little bit. But I think I will as I grow to, whether it's a field trip or this program or, you know, it's going to get done because they're great people and I've seen them do it before. It's just, it's a, it's different when you know if something were to go wrong, it, you know, you feel like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I wish I would have seen that. Or but So it's just continuing to have that strong faith in those, uh, in those leaders. Uh, and we've got great ones. So a lot of my exhaustion was self-induced. <laughs> Did you have any goals for second semester after everything that you learned from first semester? Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
and it's always my goal, uh, and I, I continue with that goal. I want to keep moving. I mean, it, and it, it, it's not try, but I, I want to keep move Marquette moving forward. Uh, what does that mean? Is we, we can't rest on our laurels. Uh, we need to look for new programs, new ways of doing things, provide more opportunities for our students, provide more opportunities for our teachers, and, and, and really create a strong sense of community. Uh, and those are bigger picture items, meaning that's kind of leading for, you know, towards the future. And, and so that still is my goal. You know, the first couple months with so many things happening uh, and also learning the job, uh, a lot of it was me making sure, again, things were running smoothly. And, and I'm looking forward to being able then to move us forward in the future. December was when the world first started learning about the COVID-19 pandemic or what would become the COVID-19 pandemic. When did it start coming into your mental periphery? Well, I watch a lot of news. Again, you know, it's the government teacher and me, so I'm always watching the news. Uh, so for me, uh, I kind of, uh, when it started hitting Europe, uh, I started getting concerned. But it really didn't hit about that week, be- that week before spring break. We knew things were happening in the United States, not, we, you know, obviously we've never seen anything like this, so I didn't know what to expect, but yeah, it was definitely on my radar, you know, spring break hit and we leave and those orders come down uh, to social distance, you know, small groups, you know, at that time we're like looking at like, we'll see what happens. My thought was like, oh my gosh, I was worried. Like if we come back after spring break and all these kids were out different places and we come back, like that could be a problem. Uh, so I was worried about that, but then halfway through spring break, they they put out that initial date, which was like April. Was it twenty third? Was the initial one? I have to go back. I, you know, it's, it's right now. It was the twenty third, but that initial, I'm like, okay. Uh, and then we, you know, we jumped into this. So what do we do for school? And that was the alternative learning plan. But before that alternative learning plan, it was how do we get teachers into the building <laughs> to get their stuff? How do we get kids Chromebooks? How do we get kids fed? How do we get kids their instruments to practice? How, I mean, that's going on, but you, you're you focused on what does your community need uh, moving forward. And at that time, it kept changing what the rules were for, you know, during this pandemic. And so you come up with a plan, and I kid you not, the night before, we can't do that anymore because now you can only allow 10 people in the building at once. Oh, my goodness. So we got to scrap everything we did. And, we, oh, uh, and then it was like, so we still have a week to do it. And then it comes down. They're shutting everything down. You have until Sunday night to get people in and out of the building. <laughs> and so that we, I got that news on Saturday morning. And so, like, well, you know, the administrative team was there like, we'll just have to be here. Get the word out to kids and get them in and out if they need things. Um, so, you know, it, it's been very much kind of reflecting on it. It was on my radar screen early but as far as how is it going to affect us. Really started thinking about that that first week before spring break. And then during spring break, I mean, it was all-encompassing. I mean, and it still has been. Things are calming down a little bit now, the new normal. But, yeah, it was it's scary stuff. I mean, it's, it's still is. Uh, you know, I know we get more and more information, which is good. But who knows when it'll be okay again, so to speak. When the first stay-at-home directive was issued in the St. Louis County area, what was it like to have to coordinate the student pickup of belongings and get all the administrators to school? Well, the admin team met me there. We all met up at school and started talking through it. Uh, and so uh, that process, we'd already um, began that process with, we sent something out to, to families to let them know and to contact the grade level if they needed to get into the building. Uh, at that time, we were not expecting to be out long. So I created a, a spreadsheet uh, to where an administrator then would go in, write the, we had time slots for days. They'd write it in a student's name. Uh, and then who was going to escort them or be there. And uh, so we, we created that, that spreadsheet, and that was real time. It looked like it was going to work really well. Uh, and that was for that, that week after when they were supposed to come back from spring break. And so that was ready to go. And then <laughs> Saturday morning, they said, we can't be in the buildings. And so that is when we reached out again. I sent something out to parents and students. And we had, uh, we were all there. The whole admin team was there Saturday and Sunday. And we had someone at the front door. And basically, we let kids in one at a time and then just made sure they were asking where they were going. They'd go there and then we'd leave and we'd let somebody else in. So it went pretty, pretty smooth, as smooth can be as far as turnaround. So 
I'm very proud of how we handled that. And, you know, kids needing medications, we got those for them. You know, and I know kids right now are like, well, I've got my, I've got, I still have items in my lockers. I still need to get things. We know, uh, hopefully, you know, really for the size of school that we, that we do have, I'm very thankful for, I think, our, our, our parents and our students who realize, yeah, it would be nice to get my coat or my shoes out of my locker room, uh, the PE locker room, but it's not a necessity. Like, I don't have to have them. Uh, because we haven't had to have a lot of people come up to school and get things. And the things they've come up to get, they've needed, meaning medications or a, a Chromebook or you know, you know, the, the things they need to access their education or for their health. So that has made it manageable. Uh, and really, that's, I think, people being very good about knowing what they need to get uh, and, and asking only for those essential things to come up. And we'll come up with a plan. Uh, you know, the reason I haven't sent a plan out right now is it, bottom line is things change and who knows what mid-may might look like as far as what we can and can't do about getting kids in the building so i could create a plan now based on what we have and what we know uh, but that can change in a week or two weeks and kids are technically still in school so unless and if they really need something we'll get them in uh, but if not, their, play, their stuff's obviously very safe. The building's locked down and it's still in their lockers. Um, there'll be an opportunity to get those items. Uh, obviously, you know, if it lingers on, we have to li- worry a little bit about seniors. Uh, but, you know, that's on my radar screen, too. We'll, we'll figure that out. So, When did you realize that we would not return to school? Well, I mean, obviously, I monitor the news and what's going on. I'm looking at other districts. Uh, I had a bad feeling in my stomach. It was it, it was a possibility, um, but I, you know, I, I found out with the announcement. Um, I had a little heads up before the, you know, uh, obviously the governor said we're done. I just had a little heads up, maybe, gosh, really just a couple hours before the district sent it out to uh, the rest of, of the community. Uh, that it was going to be shut down for the rest of the uh, for the school year. So, I mean, you know, we, we I was working off the same information. Really, you guys were like as far as hoping it was the twenty third, and then is, is it going to be April thirtieth? Because that's what I'm seeing. The stay at home order is at is it, is it going to be for the rest of the year? And I just you know you, you take it day by day, and you can control you control what you can control. Uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of the way I live my life is. Uh, those things I can't control, I do. Those things that I can't, I accept that I can't control them. Uh, the hard part is trying to figure out the difference sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. What are the behind the scenes of uh, life as an administrator these days? Wow, a lot of work. Um, I know for all of them, it, it's I'll go in at least once or twice a week to my office because uh, there's things like I get, you know, maybe a teacher in to get some tests to grade or. There's things I need to do, but, you know, I, I get up my, my normal time, um, and from basically 7.30 on in the morning, I try to stop by 8 or 9 o'clock at night, but even then, um, it, it's just, it, it's just non, it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of communication, it's a lot of answering questions, it's, it's a lot of meetings, it's just trying to k- touch base with your fellow administrators, the teachers you, you, you supervise, district personnel, and so it's, it's, it's very, it's very busy. Um, it's very busy. And I, the drawback is it's very busy without the human reward for lack of, I mean, when, when you're working with people and you're in the same room, those casual conversations, those, those friend conversations, those joking around, you know, which makes tough times tolerable. Sometimes there's less of that because it's more zoom meeting business email business, calling, you know, it's just, it's, it's constant business. And so I think that's, what's been taxing it. And it kind of put my finger on it. I think it's been taxing for teachers too, because what makes teaching fun is the classroom. What make, you know, the interaction with the kids and, and, and teaching a lesson and seeing kids get it. And how can you see kids get it when they're at home learning it? And, you know, you know, it, it, and you're not able to see that in real time, see that aha moment happen. Um, but the amount of work, it has not lessened, I will tell you that. For many students, especially seniors like myself, it seems like that the school year has already ended and yet we're not in the freedom of summer quite yet. And furthermore, no one knows when or if that release might come, but how do you feel about the situation as a whole? 
it's just it's been strange. Um, you know, if you're a senior and you're you know you, you already have your grades and you, you like them, uh, so how do you stay motivated to continue learning? Uh, I, I would just say I would argue on that. If you're planning on going to college, you better continue on doing something. You don't want to take that big of a gap. Um, what's tough is that it's not summer because we're used to getting outside, being with our friends, getting ready for those things, and so it's almost like a I don't know. It's a, it's an in between period. I mean, we're not really at school, but we're really not at summer. Uh, I'll be honest with you, um, especially for seniors, they're just bummed. There's a lot of things that they're missing out on. That that last month of school is just so much fun for seniors. Just it's exciting. Everyone's kind of scared the same way, so to speak, realizing, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm getting ready to leave high school. Uh, and those are fun and, and 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 good things to do as a group. And that setting to help you kind of get through it. And so I imagine, especially for seniors, this is very difficult to kind of process. This is how my high school career is ending, and I'm getting ready to go on to that next step. And so some of those rites, those, those rites of passage, those those celebrations, that's why we're really trying to work as hard as we can to either A, virtually make them happen, or hopefully physically make them happen at a later date. Uh, so we really have not taken anything off the table because we don't want to yet. Now, we're not going to do anything that puts anybody in jeopardy. So we're going to adhere by whatever the health department says. But the hope is things get better. But if they don't, you know, you guys are resilient. You'll get through this. Uh, it's just unfortunate that uh, for you guys that this is it's kind of the way you had to end your, your, your high school career and you know, I, I know our, your, your teachers miss you horribly, and you guys miss your teachers because that's fun for us, too, to watch you guys and congratulate you. And You can do it on Zoom and you can wave, but it's different when it's face-to-face in the classroom and in the halls. It's just a different feel. You can't replace it. I'm sure there are tons of upperclassmen out there that want to know, what can you tell me about prom, graduation, and the senior lock-in? Yeah, uh, so like you know, we're definitely still looking at plans on how to f- do a physical graduation. We're looking at backup dates. You know, graduation depending on when it happens might look different as far as what we traditionally have because you know you start. I, mean, I thought about what about music? What about bands? I mean, our, our choir hasn't had a chance to practice together. Our band hasn't. But mo- more importantly, we want an opportunity for kids to have that ceremony, walk across the stage, have that opportunity with their parents. I've spoken with our, our market parent organization that puts together grad night. They still very much want to have one uh, if we have a physical graduation. And so that's not off the table. Uh, you know, prom, prom is getting more and more difficult to see if we can possibly make it happen. Not completely off the table. It's just as far as logistic wise, uh, it might be much more difficult as far as getting things together, finding a venue. I, I you know, the, uh, no final decision has been made on that yet either. I know that's like, I, I wish I could give dates and, like when it first happened, I was able to, again, plans, right? Here's the, here's the fallback plate. Here's the date. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're doing it. I was getting the DJ set up. Uh, Janet Koch, who's in charge of prom, you know, she was getting, you know, talked to the butt cake people and the props people. Like we were ready to roll for May 9th uh, within a week. We were ready to go. And then, nope, <laughs> that got flushed. Uh, so I was like, Ugh. and now you get into, if things do open up, we're not only competing with other high school proms, right? We're competing with wedding season. Think about how many people have planned on getting married during this time and uh, have had to push it back. Uh, you know, I, I have, you know, my wife has a friend who had a wedding planned and uh, they're, they're having to move it. I mean, that's, so all these venues, and you, you think about the, the ripple effect on businesses and everything. There's a lot. There's a lot out there that that has an impact on those decisions. If that makes sense. Oh, that I can't control on that that avenue. So I know we've talked about a lot of serious topics over the past hour, but I want to know collectively what was this year like for you? Still going. <laughs> this year has been probably one of the biggest learning experiences I've ever had um, and for that I'm very thankful uh, it's been exciting it's been stressful it's been um, a lot of rewarding work uh, and really I'll be honest with you, it makes me excited for next year I, I, I think I, th- I think I've done a good job 
but I think I can do an even better job next year. So uh, for me, um, I am pleased with how this year went as far as what I can control. Uh, and I'm pleased with a lot of the circumstances that happened uh, or, or, you know, kind of the situations we're in. But, um, man, it's been, uh, it's been a challenging year for any administrator. Uh, this would be for anybody and, and what's going on. It, you know, it's just been a, uh, a very, um, I guess, extra challenging year for being brand new to the position. It's created a lot of uh, challenges to overcome and a lot of things to think about. And, um, you know, for, uh, again, look at the bright side of things. I have, uh, a I've had a lot of experiences this year and a lot of things to fall back on later on in my career as far as how to handle things uh, and, and what to do. So, uh, I think I'll take a lot from this year, uh, which will only make uh, Marquette better and hopefully me a better principal. Do you have a message or any advice for students who may be listening? Wow, advice! Uh, I will. I will leave them with kind of my mantra. Uh, my advice is to uh, accept the things that you cannot change. Change the things you can. And hopefully you've got the wisdom to know the difference uh, and just be patient, um, especially in this in this time. There are things that you can control. Uh, you can control your attitude. You can control kind of work you do uh, and how much you do. Um, you can't control what's going on with the pandemic as far as worldwide, but you can control what you do as far as social distancing, keeping yourself healthy, doing what you need to do. And when you take control of that, it does give you a sense of calm. Uh, and then being able to accept those things you can't change um, because there's circumstances out of your control um, and being able to, I think a lot of times people spend a lot of their energy focusing on those things that they really can't change. But the hard part is knowing that difference. That comes with time, that comes with experience. And sometimes you will spend some, you'll, you'll spend a lot of energy on something you really later on realize you can't change. But that's a lesson learned. That's something later on you can use to make a better judgment call. Uh, so I, I think that's my kind of my advice for all those students listening is that, you know, take control of what you can control. And uh, those that you can't be okay. Uh, but just continue being strong during this time. It will pass. Uh, and you will look back someday at this and say, you know, to your grandchildren, you know, I, I lived through it because hopefully, you know, God forbid this ever happens again. Uh, so hopefully this is a once in a generational thing. So, mm -hmm. Ideally, what does next school year look like for you? Ideally? Oh, my gosh. Every team wins state. Um, let's see here. Every single student is a, you know, a, perfect ACT and, uh, or, or, or uh, goes, gets the job they want right out of school. And no, you know, that would be the perfect school year. And every teacher is completely fulfilled from what they're doing and gets great feedback. And uh, realistically hope is that um, everyone grows. Uh, and what I mean by that, we, we grow when things go well, but also we grow when things go wrong. Uh, and so I just hope we continue into next year that it is a, it's a great year overall for everybody, that it's positive, that we build a stronger community, uh, that everybody at our school got, you know, what a great school if everyone felt like they belonged and had a place to be. Uh, if somehow I could ever accomplish that, everything else will fall into place. Because if you feel like you belong, that it's your school, that you take pride in your school, uh, then you'll take pride in what you do. You'll take pride in the halls, halls being clean, <laughs> take pride in your education, take pride in how teachers are treated, how you treat others. Uh, so I just want everyone to, you know, that's my hope for next school year. And if that can happen, wow, that would be awesome. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, Dr. Hankins. You've certainly shared a lot of uh, good insight and knowledge with the our community and everyone listening. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.